Son. I'm so happy to see all these faces in the audience. We can feel the excitement in the room. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our judges for this episode. Miss Rhea Rambley, lead editor, broadcast and news anchor, CNC3. Mr. Mushtaq Mohammed, general manager, Paria Fuel Trading Company Limited. And Dr. Richard Taylor, senior lecturer in organic materials, chemistry. And joining me on stage is our timekeeper, Ms. Jamie Simmons. Debate teams, you represent the future of our country and our nation's children and youth. You have all spent time researching and thinking critically about your timely topics. But you are also here today to listen critically as you present and share your ideas and perspectives. Please remember that remaining calm and composed while delivering your rebuttals and arguments in front of your teammates, opponents and judges contribute to your credibility. The debate will be conducted as follows. The proposition will speak for four minutes to present their case with two minutes to summarize. The opposition will speak for four minutes to present their case with two minutes to summarize. Debaters. You are required to stand when you speak and stay within your time limits. Members of the House, while I hope you enjoy this preliminary round, please remain respectful and sensitive to our debaters and judges. Our third motion for this second preliminary round is, who should be held accountable for spreading misinformation on social media? Our first debate team is as follows. Proposing the motion is Holy Cross College Arima. And opposing the motion is Holy Faith Convent Kuva. Once again, the motion is, who should be held accountable for the spreading of misinformation on social media? Individual users or platform owners? The proposition speaker is Cameron Glodan. So firstly, we'd like to define what misinformation is. Misinformation is any information proliferated that it can either be true or false. Based on moral code that has existed for centuries, the liability of one's actions has befall the individual. This principle also extends to the online space. As such, the individual user is responsible for the verification of any information consumed and shared, not just misinformation, any information. The platform owners cannot shut down everything we do. It would infringe, our it would infringe on our freedom of speech, our freedom of expression. We live in a democracy, no? They already have systems in place. They have fact checks on Instagram. They have it on Twitter. Is it enough? All the rampant misinformation these days. It's already been put in place, these systems. So when the opponent comes to the podium and says, yes, of course, they should, the social media companies should be responsible, we trust us. We'll put algorithms in place. We'll put uh, measures in place to, to keep misinformation off our platform. Just remember that it's been tried and it's failed multiple times. Plat platforms, social media platforms tried to censor, not, not help misinformation, censor misinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic. But the misinformation still went through, no? 27.5% of YouTube videos analyzed during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic were found to be misinformation. That's one, almost one in three videos by Can COVID. Tweets were analyzed the four months before and after the COVID-19 pandemic an 80% increase in vaccine negative positions were found on Twitter. Not just the COVID-19 vaccine, all vaccines, because why? Misinformation on the internet. Everyone can see it. Yes, of course we need, we need freedom. We need freedom. 
Where are we? We're in Trinidad and Tobago, no? A democracy, yes? The freedom of speech that we so enjoy every day here, this discussion, it comes with a responsibility. A responsibility to check all the information that you share on online, everything. Just by sharing it, you're helping. Whether it's true or false, think about it, please. We'll give the social media companies an inch, just this bit, and say, yes, please help us. And then you know what will happen? They'll take two inches, three, and then where will we? Where will we be? We'll be communist China. Under Mao, no one can speak. We'll be under Hitler's regime in Germany. No one can speak, no freedoms, nothing. Stalin in the Soviet Union. Thank you. I now invite our opposition speaker, Anaya Philip Pitt, to the mic. A pleasant good day, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observe. Despite what some would like to believe, platform owners should be held accountable for the speaking of misinformation on social media platforms, as these social media platforms are not neutral conduits, meaning that they have a bias towards sensationalized content. According to a journal, According to a study by the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication in 2020, which found that misinformation is more likely to go viral on social media platforms due to algorithm biases. Additionally, as these social media platforms are able to favor the sensationalized content, they are also able to place robust fact-checking systems into their already existing algorithms. However, these social media platforms do not fulfill their technological capability and ethical responsibility to stop the spread of misinformation. If you don't believe me, esteemed audience, take it from Harvard, a reputable source, which states that in the Harvard Journal of Law and Technology in 2023, social media platforms possess the technological capability and ethical responsibility to proactively address and prevent the spread of misinformation. Keyword, proactively address. The proposition mentioned that individual users should be responsible for the verification of any information. However, we all know that especially for young persons like myself, we get our information from social media platforms. And it is the owner's responsibility to verify this information through the use of their robust amount of fact-checking mechanisms, which they can implement into their already existing algorithms. The proposition also mentioned that during COVID-19, they attempted to censor misinformation, however, it was still able to go through. This information was able to go through because of a delayed response from platform owners, according to our very own Guardian Media outlet in 2021, which stated that in Trinidad and Tobago, during the dissemination of misinformation about public health measures, the delayed response from platform owners allowed for harmful narratives to gain traction and lead to real-world consequences. Let's talk more about these real-world consequences. Social media platform owners like Meta, who owns Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and X, formerly known as Twitter, was sued in 40 states of the United States of America, as well as Washington, D.C., for deceptive practices as they were actively participating in the spread of misinformation. Additionally, it is not only the United States that has sued Meta for this kind of of situation. It has also been international communities such as Africa, where have, they have been sued for political violence as their failure to swiftly react to misinformation led to political violence.
In conclusion, we the opposition argue that social media platform owners should be held accountable for the spread of misinformation on social media platforms, as it is their platforms. They own these platforms. They are not neutral conduits. And if they can push sensationalized content, which oftentimes favors misinformation towards the youth and everyone else, then they are able to take more accountability and ensure that the platforms which they have created prevent the spread of misinformation, which does not only affect the digital world, but also the real world. Thank you for listening. An intriguing debate thus far. Thank you both teams. I invite you now to take five minutes to confer. Our five minutes is now over. So I invite our proposition summary speaker, Mikkel Pemberton to the mic. Without freedom of speech, we do not have a democracy. In a democracy, there are a list of rights we all have. And with those rights, we have responsibilities. Individual users online has the right to free speech. But what comes with that right is a responsibility to make sure that the information that is spread by them is ethical, that is truthful. These individuals do not abide by this responsibility that has been granted to them from the right to free speech. And I ask you, if we cannot stand up to the responsibility and be held accountable for what we spread, do we, do we have any right to the free speech that we've all been fighting for? Do you have any right to the democracy that we have found ourselves in? I ask you. Giving the responsibility to the platform owners takes away our right to responsibility, takes away our right to free speech. You give them the, the power to dictate what is spread on their platform. With that, it takes away the responsibility we have to listen and to conversate with others that we found ourselves on online. So I ask you, the right thing to do is to focus and to keep your to keep your sorry i ask you in the situation we find ourselves today with the comfort we find being anonymous behind our keyboards what is our responsibility our responsibility should not be fueled by the greed we get for the monetizing of our platforms Thank you. I now invite our opposition summary speaker, Lisa Ye. Our first proposition, opposition speaker, Anaya, mentioned that the owners of the platforms have influence and power over what type of information is being spread. And they are responsible, sorry, they are responsible for the algorithms which deal with content visibility. Moreover, they address they selectively address misinformation on multiple platforms, which are mainly owned by Meta. According to an extract in NBC News 2021, Facebook was sued $2 billion, which allowed and promoted political violence in Africa. Another article in 2021 by NBC News. Joe Biden, the president of the United States of America, mentioned that that um, that you mentioned that COVID-19 and vaccines had misinformation spread on them through Facebook. As a matter of fact, Passati from the White House, a press secretary, stated that Facebook was not doing enough to stop the spread of false information on coronavirus. They put profits above ethics. They do not care. In 2017, 2018, and 2021, from Facebook site themselves, they stated that they were attempting to. But are they really attempting to if they're just going to let everything like that happen? The proposition stated that they tried and failed. However, they failed to provide evidence to back that up. As a matter of fact, they may even be unaware of the current status of social media platforms, as they mentioned, X as Twitter. They actively engage in misinformation as well, through that example. 
The platform is not the government. They are not responsible for upholding our government system. Thank you. Congratulations to both teams. I now invite our judges feedback. All right, um, just, just feedback to, to both teams. I think both teams, well, the position of both teams, I think, were fairly strong, right? One's focus on personal responsibility, while the other focus on the algorithms and the information systems within platforms, which I think was good. What, what I think was needed a little bit more from the proposing team is a little more examples and a little more personal examples where people may have been, you know, where, where responsibility have sh was shown to actually benefit the spread of information. I think there are a few examples like that that would have helped and strengthened the argument. And on the, on the opposing team, I think there was a piece missing on the power of the algorithms and the ethics behind platform platform usage that should have you know strengthened the argument on that side but overall i think you know very very compelling and on both sides of the uh, the discussion um i felt this was a difficult topic for me personally to grasp it and then to try and argue it in my brain so i could only imagine and how it may have been for you both um i felt that um, neither side really um, drove home the point for me. Um, so as much as I was confused in my head, I didn't have clear indicators from either side as to your positions. You had good information, but the positioning and the driving it home, uh, I felt that wasn't there. I felt that on the opposition side, Anaya, you were very confident in your delivery, which is great. Um, but. I think we could have been a little bit clearer on both sides of where we want to push this argument. I would say that um, uh, neither side, and in general, of course, commendable, but neither side actually showed why the other side is actually incorrect, is actually wrong. You know, um, and I think that was missing. Thank you, judges, and thank you, both teams. So we ask viewers at home. Who should be held accountable for spreading misinformation on social media? Thank you. Hey, hello guys, welcome. Come have a seat. Oh, this is so stylish and I love the fabric. Darlings, you must tell us where you got your new furnishings. We got them locally at Standard. They've got new chic European furniture, crafted from high quality material. Oh, Standard? No, it's Standard, their brand new Hive collection. Experience luxurious European furniture at a price you will love. The Hive collection, now exclusively available at Standard. quality delights you know and love. Devon Creams. Smiles in every bite. Gaming Express Limited is a premium importer and retailer of the highest quality brand name electronics. We stock the widest range of PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, Samsung and Apple devices and accessories. Visit us at Shop 52 Level 2 Gulf City Mall in San Fernando or contact us by phone or WhatsApp message at 687-7480 or 301-9797 or 798-1280. Like our Facebook and Instagram pages for updates on products and services. Republic Bank is invested in our communities with over 80 million spent on projects and programs. We're empowering entrepreneurs with free tools and resources. We're the region's largest indigenous bank spanning 185 years, 14 countries and 23 subsidiaries. We were the first Caribbean signatory to the United Nations principles for responsible banking. We're giving our customers greater banking convenience with state-of-the-art electronic banking solutions. We're invested in you. It's better together. This amazing, this crazy combo make you want the great thing. Cookie meat the chocolate. Can't live without it. 
hundred percent goodness, me want them one chocolate digestive. Rich chocolate with cookie crunchiness. Cookie beats chocolate in Devon chocolate digestive. Better because it's both. Now two dollars. Win, win, win free groceries for a year at Extra Foods. 12 lucky shoppers will win. Check out Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok for details. Plus, halal turkeys, $1.99. Gala apples, $10 for $20. Grapefruits, chicken hams, $99. Swiss pasta cuts, four packs for $20. Imperial margarine, three for $20. Johnny Walker Black Label, $2.49. And so much more. Also, our Christmas hours, 7 a.m. to 12 midnight until December 23rd for your convenience. Extra Foods, always extra for less. Contest approved by the NLCB. We now move on to our second motion. Our second motion that will be debated is companies should hire equal men and women in the workplace to ensure there is no gender bias. Proposing the motion is Naparima Girls and opposing the motion is Presentation College San Fernando. Once again, the motion is, companies should hire equal men and women in the workplace to ensure that there is no gender bias. The proposition speaker is Elizabeth Singh. We welcome you to the mic. No country can ever truly flourish if it stifles the potential of its women and deprives itself of the contribution of half of its citizens. Michelle Obama. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for our debate today is that companies should in fact hire equal numbers of men and women in the workplace to ensure that there's no gender bias. We define our topic as firms employing the same number of men and women on staff in order to achieve gender equality. But what is gender equality? Well, according to the United Nations, this refers to the equal rights, responsibilities, and opportunities of men and women and girls and boys. Furthermore, the gender bias can be seen as behavior that shows favoritism of one gender over another. And according to the European Institute of Gender Equality, gender bias is most often the act of putting men over women, implying that women are not equal in men, in men, in, in rights and dignity. Therefore, we, the proposition, stand with unwavering confidence that in our claim, men and women should in fact be hired in equal numbers to eliminate gender bias and instill gender equality to make our communities safer and healthier. And isn't that all that we want? But ladies and gentlemen, do you all see this right here? This is what I face, what we face. This is a glass ceiling effect. The glass ceiling effect refers to invisible barriers that women and minorities experience that prohibit them from advancing in our workplace just because they are women or minorities. I'm sure that you can think of, what, three, maybe one, female CEO, well, do you know Samsung, Katia, Mr. Kati, Elmer's? I just named four massive, massive companies in this world that have almost 0% of women in their leadership roles. I repeat, ladies and gentlemen, 0% of women in their C-suites. Employing equal numbers of men and women can actually contribute greatly towards removing these metaphorical hurdles and achieving gender parity. So how can we do this, you may ask? Well, we can implement gender quotas, which are actually affirmative action measures, measures which require a certain number or proportion of women in the workplace. And compelling evidence actually suggests that gender quotas encourage gender equality and the participation of women in decision-making areas where they have been traditionally underrepresented. And some of you might think, okay, it helps women, but what about the men? Quotas can actually help men in the sectors where they are underrepresented, like right here in Trinidad in the education system. Our prime minister himself stated that in the education system in Trinidad and Tobago, there are 13,906 teachers in all of Trinidad and only just above 3,000 male teachers, even if there are more male students than female students. And he said that more has to be done in order to correct this action, as having equal amounts of both sexes can actually improve the gender knowledge of students and teach them how to communicate 
responsibly and non-violently and positively with other adults. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, companies should in fact employ this policy as it can aid in eliminating gender bias, not only at the workplace, but in all of society. Gender equality remains the greatest human rights challenge for all time. And the time is now for the economic empowerment of not only men, but of women too. Thank you. I now invite the opposition speaker, Josiah Adolphus, to the mic. Good day, everyone. I would like to say welcome. First of all, we need, before going on with this debate, we first need to understand what is gender bias. Gender bias is a tendency to prefer one gender over another. Gender, this is a type of implicit bias. Gender bias is based on socially constructed expectations and rules, and is more inclusive as it includes prejudice and discrimination against both men and women. So I know the proposition may have said that it focuses on women, but it focuses on prejudice against both men and women. Now, my first point, which will support this, is that we should, by implementing this practice, by hiring equal men and women and putting this as more important, it's going to make gender a larger determinant than credentials. We already live in a society in which women already face more challenges in getting a job. And now adding gender as a larger determinant than their credentials, it just makes it much harder for them. Imagine an individual has been working years to get their doctorate. They are the most qualified and most experienced applicant. But yet, because she is a woman and because the quota of women is filled, she is not going to be chosen. This doesn't seem fair, in my opinion. My second point is that by implementing this, it doesn't mean that gender bias is going to fly out the window. Gender bias is a learned behavior, and as stated before, gender bias is based on socially constructed expectations and rules. These expectations and rules are throughout our society, and our children can pick up on them extremely easily. This is corroborated by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, which reports that gender stereotypes and biases can be learned as early as childhood. So therefore, hiring equal men and women uh, is not going to help these pre-learned things that the children are picking up on. It's only going to solve a part of the problem, which is, brings me to my final point. The difference in number of men and women as workers is only a part of the problem. Fixing a symptom is not going to fix the entire issue of gender bias, and it is not going to fix the other symptoms, such as the disparities in parental leave and the lack of opportunity for advancement in women in the workplace. We would first like to bring up Columbia University. A study shows that gender bias is still found in the recommendation process. Recommendations are what ensures that a person who deserves it receives a promotion. Now, if gender bias still exists in the people who are giving these recommendations, doesn't this mean that the people who deserve it will not get it because they already have this bias in their mind against these people? And also, I would like to bring up the Ministry of Labor. When research was done on maternity leave in Trinidad and Tobago, it was found to be 14 weeks, one month with full pay, and two months with half pay. Now, when the same research was done for paternity leave, there was no information found. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is that trying to hire equal men and women is going to solve a part of the large issue, when we need to focus on all the parts to collectively break this issue. I'd like to end by saying, when we are studying for a test, do we study one topic and expect to pass, or do we study multiple and that gets the job done? Thank you. Thank you, both teams. You now have five minutes to consult. Our five minutes are now over. I now invite our proposition summary speaker, Siri Valmondi, to the mic. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start off by saying, Rome was not built in a day, was it? As you have mentioned, we should not study one topic for an exam, but isn't that still better than studying zero for an exam? Having women in underrepresented positions, even if it's through gender quotas, can go on to address issues such as the pay gap. Do you know that women only earn 83 cents for every dollar that a man earns? Or have you ever wondered that in the US, women outnumber men in earning bachelor's and master's degrees, but there has yet never been a single president who is female in the United States? 
You have also said that having gender quotas will undermine the principles of meritocracy. But what you all have not presumed is that the principles of meritocracy also claim that everyone was given an even field. I would argue that women are not given an even field. They face many problems, such as the glass ceiling barriers mentioned by the first proposition speaker, along with sexual harassment in the workplace and a more difficult work-life balance. I now quote COP Senator Nicole Dyer Griffith when I say, when our sittings in the parliament would go from 1.30 p.m. Straight, straight through to 5 a.m. the next morning, many issues of personal life management would come to fore. Women are faced with many societal expectations. Furthermore, you have also mentioned the maternity leave. I would like to start. Don't you think it is inhumane to summarize a woman's worth by her natural ability to give birth? Also, in Sweden, the country with the highest gender equality points in the European Union, do you know that maternity leave is not restricted to a woman alone, or that paternity leave is not restricted to fathers? Rather, a combined leave of 480 days is given to both genders so that the maternity leave is no longer an excuse to avoid the hiring of women. And a McKinsey research suggests that gender diverse organizations outperform their peers in many ways, with up to, and they're 25% more likely to have the above average profitability. To summarize, I would like to say, considering all these points, that, that as Malala Yousafzai once expressed, we cannot all succeed when half of us are held back. Thank you. I now invite our opposition summary speaker, Terrell Andrews, to the mic. Ladies and gen gentlemen of the audience, uh, before I begin, I would just like to repeat. <clears throat> before I begin my speech, I would just like to rebut a few points made by the proposition. They would have rightfully said that a pay gap exists. Yes, a pay gap, not a wage gap. The difference in uh, the difference in wages earned is accounted between the amount of hours worked. Women, on, on average, tend to work less hours than men and do not seek promotions as often. So thank you for the thank you for the proposition for affirming my point. As my opening speaker would have eloquently articulated, perhaps more eloquent than I shall be, gender bias is a deep-rooted social ill and must be treated as such. Would a doctor, when presented with a sick patient, rush to utilize all their medical resources or pause for a moment and look at a bigger picture in an effort to pinpoint the cause? Implementing a, implementing a gender quota to equalize the ratio of men and women in the workplace does not address the internalized bias of employees and managers, nor the social stigmas that lead to the disparity in genders in the first place. It is a token gesture that is inherently flawed in its nature. By implementing strict gender quotas, individuals are stripped of their merits and qualifications, and their worth is seen only in their gender. A solution for gender bias cannot be making gender the focal point of your character. A definition you should all be familiar with by now, gender bias is the preference or preferential treatment of one gender over another. Gimmicks such as artificial inclusion is not a solution to this matter. We must address the root cause of it. And as my opening speaker would have said, it is a deep-rooted social ill. We must address it with social reform. By instilling better norms and values in our children and teens in education and at a home, we can we can work towards a society where, not, where artificial inclusion is not needed because our individuals have progressive beliefs that is beneficial to all. I'd like to add an article by, by Rebecca Valentine of IGN shows an example. Thank you. This concludes our second debate of our second preliminary round. Thank you to both teams for presenting on a timely topic. Now we hear from our judges. So we have an all-girls school and an all-boys school debating a gender topic. Uh, this is very interesting. Um, I would say that uh, the proposition team, I felt like you did not really relate gender bias to the workplace and give us examples of how that is happening. Um, also, you need to yeah, demonstrate the gender bias, give us the examples. So I felt that that would have been an area to improve on. And I also felt on the opposition team, your arguments were clear and succinct. Um, I like how you brought it home with the um, numbers will not eliminate bias. And I thought that was a very salient point. Sometimes, guys, in debates, when you have to summarize, you have to weigh between rebuttal and reinforcement. So that's something to think about going forward. Um, so again, uh, very good job um, by both teams. I do think, though, that there should have been 
a little bit more focus on the negative effects or consequences of gender bias or, or the lack of gender bias um, from either team. Um, I think that would have been really substantive in making your points. Um, I also think that I, I thought that the point raised by the opposition um, team with respect to gender bias not just being with respect to women was important to, to, to make a note of. I, I, for me, I thought, um, I thought in both cases the argument could be focused a little bit more on the workplace and on the proposing team. I think the one solid argument that was made by the summary speaker is gender diverse organizations produce better profitability. And I thought more could have been added to that to give the argument strength. And um, you know, the issue of quotas not being the answer, I just felt that a little more, some real specific examples of where it didn't work would have been added a lot more to it. So just being more specific around the examples for me would have been helpful to both arguments. Thank you very much, judges, and congratulations to both teams for making your point. I now invite you to take your seats in the audience. It's been five years since Paria Fuel Trading Company Limited, Paria, began its journey as a subsidiary of Trinidad Petroleum Holdings Limited. As we celebrate our five-year anniversary, we reflect on all the highs, lows, challenges, and accomplishments. Paria has contributed to the local economy through job creation, high revenue, providing a reliable supply of fuel, corporate taxes, and community programs. We are grateful for our employees, contractors, and loyal customers who have helped us reach this milestone. We are Paria, celebrating five years, the passion and energy to make a difference. Republic Bank is invested in our communities with over 80 million spent on projects and programs. We're empowering entrepreneurs with free tools and resources. We're the region's largest indigenous bank spanning 185 years, 14 countries and 23 subsidiaries. We were the first Caribbean signatory to the United Nations principles for responsible banking. We're giving our customers greater banking convenience with state-of-the-art electronic banking solutions. We're invested in you. The biggest Christmas sale is at CV Optical. Get an amazing 60% off designer frames. Also, get 40% off prescription lenses. Plus, you get a free pair of Polaroid sunglasses on selected purchases. See us today at CV Optical, affordable eye care for everyone. Wondering where you're getting money to spend this Christmas? PECU welcomes both new and existing members to take advantage of our unsecured Christmas loans up to $20,000. Or get that showroom or roll-on roll-off vehicle with only 10% down payment. Call us at 623-5561, 624-3280 or WhatsApp 294-1122 for more information. Terms and conditions and normal lending criteria applies. PECU Credit Union, where your needs are up. Okay, so Skipper Kumar and all the players are on a tea and snack break. This break is brought to you by the traditional and delicious Chata Kuma. It's so crunchy and irresistible, it can knock your stunts out. Tanti Joy says she tell them about I am movement long time. Tanti say everybody want to take bamboo these days. Just now the bamboo patch would barely have anything. She say vetive grass is the way of the future. Tanti say all part of this 10 foot plant beneficial. The living plant that helps with water and soil conservation. The roots is a treatment for the contaminated land and water. Oh gosh, don't talk about slope stabilization and erosion. Vetiver roots have that covered. One last thing, Tanti is to plant some vetiver grass and help with climate change. Win, 
win, win free groceries for a year at Extra Foods. 12 lucky shoppers will win. Check out Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok for details. Plus, halal turkeys, $1.99. Gala apples, $10 for $20. Grapefruits, chicken hams, $99. Swiss pasta cuts, four packs for $20. Imperial margarine, three for $20. Johnny Walker Black Label, $2.49. And so much more. Also, our Christmas hours, 7 a.m. to 12 midnight until December 23rd for your convenience. Extra Foods, always extra for less. Contest approved by the NLCB. Our third motion for the second preliminary round is, should individuals be held accountable for their carbon footprint? Proposing the motion is Queen's Royal College. And opposing the motion is St. Anthony's College. The proposition speaker is Jonah Budrat. We welcome you to the mic. All protocols observed. Today we will be proposing the motion that individuals should be held accountable for their carbon footprints. But before we delve into this discussion, let me first set a groundwork of some basic definitions. So a carbon footprint as described by the Nature Conservancy is the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions caused by an individual, either directly or indirectly. It is a quantification of a person's negative impact upon the environment. With this in mind, I would, like, I would now like to expound on why we believe that the reinforcement of a mindset of personal accountability among society is the solution to solve the climate change problem on a societal level. So first and foremost, we must realize that the cumulative effect of individual action has the potential to accomplish change on an extraordinary level. Now, while the opposition may well argue that individual attempts to reduce carbon footprints may be nullified by the effect of larger corporations, I agree that this will, may be true, but we have to consider the outcome as well, where a domino effect occurs amongst individuals, where the action of one influences the actions of many. And then we come to a point where, according to the climate group organization, if we all band together this mass accumulation, this massive accumulation of individuals we have on planet Earth, if we were all to band together and switch out, let's say, incandescent light bulbs for LEDs, we can remove effectively 1,400 million tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and eliminate the need for more than 1,200 power stations, we can eliminate the need for the, their construction. So here we see the indubitable power that lies in the collaborative effect and in the numbers that we can utilize as a society. Everyone coming together, doing their part, acting within their own capacity, that is what evokes change. The foundation of change on a societal level has always been cooperation, and that is all we require, whether it is in recycling or whether it is in switching gas stoves and cars for their electric counterparts. That is what we all we need from society, and it is the culmination of these factors that will eventually lead to humanity's progress. Now, for all those who are speculative of the plausibility of these suggested changes, I would have to ask you one question. Where do you think we would have been today if not for the visionaries of the previous generations? Those thinkers who were able to stray from the path, the pack of conventional thinkers, stray from convention and go down a path less traveled, face opposition and still achieve progress. Where would we have been if not for the likes of Roland and Molina, two scientists whose research went into the formation of the Montreal Protocol in 1987. For those who don't know, it's a protocol that banned globally the use of CFCs, and many attribute that to the reduction in the size of the hole in the ozone layer that we can now recognize today. In a similar way, we need visionaries today, and we must foster a mindset in today's society that will produce visionaries, innovators of equal magnitude that can propel our generations forward into a sustainable future. We must not be cowardly. We must not be pessimistic in how we look at the issue. Many might say that we are entrenched in an oil and gas industry and it's hard to go back, but we need to start the shift because if we don't, we will be forsaking the well-being of our future generations. And the further along the line that they will have to pick up the slack, who knows where it will lead for humanity. Negligence on our part will not only be indicative of cowardice, but also it will be a detrimental act of humanity. 
I now invite opposition speaker Isaiah Hills to the mic. Tell me, why have we decided to minimize the need of average men? I stand here with the views against individuals being fully responsible for the carbon footprint. As my friends, of course, have, have defined carbon footprint, I pose these points. What about the lack of affordability and accessibility to green technology with respect to developing countries? According to the UN, developing countries have moderately low human development um, index levels reflecting lower income status. Studies also in the Netherlands state that green products are 75 to 85 percent more expensive than normal products. These persons in these developing countries don't have the choice. The eco economic divide between Sorry, the economic divide creates a scenario where individuals in developing nations lack the affordability to make the green choice. They don't have the choice to go green. They don't have the choice to go eco-friendly. They don't have the luxuries to, go, to have solar panels or electric vehicles to empower their life. They lack the choice. They lack that choice. This lack of choice should not be the basis upon holding them solely responsible for their carbon footprint. Secondly, let us talk about the independence or the dependence of carbon materials in our world right now. We are all dependent on carbon right now. Carbon-based products are found everywhere in our lives and from the containers that we eat our food in, to the nylon that you are wearing, to even the seats you sit on. That is also carbon. Should you be responsible for that? Should you really be responsible for this? No, I think not. These industries also themselves create job opportunities for these persons in developing countries who don't have a choice. This is their lifeline that you're trying to take away from them. Did they choose that? No, I think not. The bigger question that we should be talking about is how did we even get upon these dependencies? The reality is that many of these industries serve as aid, providing empowerment, employment and allowing them to sustain their families. Are we really going to cut that away from them? Lastly, I would like to talk about the disparities between individual and organization. Now, emissions. Statistics shows that individuals emit four to six metric tons per year, while organizations emit 100,000 to a million metric tons. So who should be really responsible? The person, the breadwinner, or the organizations? Thank you. Debaters, you now have five minutes to consult. Our five minutes of allotted time is now over. I invite Proposition Summary Speaker Jonah Boudra to the floor. So my worthy opposition did well in mentioning that cost is usually a source of issue for many people trying to go green. However, the example that I drew actually does, does not cause that problem to arise. So LEDs are actually, though they are more expensive, they last 20 times longer than incandescent light bulbs. So that is just one example of a measure that can be taken in a cost-effective way that will still yield a significant impact. Next, they would have spoken about how 
Well, individuals are just restrained by the economy, by the lack of infrastructure. Well, my rebuttal to that is simply this. It starts with the small steps. The largest, the longest journeys that we can ever embark on starts with a single step. Even if we recycle, those who are within their means to afford electric powered cars or stoves, they can do that. Those who just have to recycle, they can stick to that. But again, the accumulative effect is what causes the change. They mentioned that each individual are responsible for only 4.6 tons of carbon dioxide emissions, as opposed to a staggering amount for companies and, and organizations. But I propose for your consideration this simple fact. Imagine 4.6 tons for an individual, it sounds meager, but imagine 4.6 tons multiplied by 8 billion. How many tons will be saved? How many tons will be preserved if that would be the case? Again, I would like to reiterate the power in numbers, the effect of accumulative effort. Next, they would have to talked about organizations and how they far outweigh the impact of individuals. Well, guess what? Organizations are made up of individuals. And if we allow individuals to retain this mindset that it is not their, their responsibility, it is not their accountability, we will never reach innovation. We will never allow individuals to come out into society with mindsets to change that which may have existed for a long time. How will change come about? That's it. I now invite opposition summary speaker, Janique Green, to the floor. I think my opponent conveniently forgot to mention organization and community when giving the definition of carbon footprint. It is unjust and unfair to hold individuals solely accountable for their carbon footprint when economic and constraints and dependence of carbon industries limit their choices due to everyday expenses and economic status which they have not chosen which we have not chosen. Organizations must share the responsibility by adapting and adopting sustainable practices and global efforts should be made to bridge the economic gap, ensuring that green technology becomes accessible to all. Alison West of Trinidad and Tobago said, our environment is a thread that supports all sectors. It must be managed for the present and future generations. QRC stated that the past is looked at. We should not look at the past. We should look at the future and we should look at the present. St. Anthony's is emitting excellent students like carbon dioxide is being emitted. The individual cannot be held responsible because it is actually the industry and the organization that should be held responsible. I repeat, the individual should not be held responsible, but the organizations and institutions. Thank you for listening. This concludes our last round of the second preliminary round. Thank you to both teams and congratulations. Viewers, should you be held responsible for your carbon footprint? I invite our judges to give their feedback. So again, a, a very interesting topic to debate and one that is very, very important, um, especially considering the challenges that we face as a society with respect to environmental issues and climate change and so on. Um, I do think though that, uh, and so I commend the teams for actually you know, probing the topic quite well. Uh, I do think though that um, the pr proposition perhaps could have made uh, some better arguments or stronger arguments um, with respect to the consequences or the effects of carbon footprint. I know that you would have mentioned climate change, but it would have been good to actually sort of um, uh, link uh, how detrimental um, neglecting or not taking responsibility for your carbon footprint have uh, on society in particular. Um, with respect to the opposition, um, I think that there should have been a strong, some, some stronger points made about who should be responsible um, outside of the organizations. Yes, you're stressing that the organizations should be, should be responsible, but why can't individuals be responsible? You should have made that point as to why it is that individuals should, be, should not be held responsible um, to make your point stronger, I think. 
Yeah, some strong arguments from both sides. I like how the proposition side drove home the it is humanity's progress, um, but I felt that it should have had greater demonstration of individual responsibility. So we keep talking about individuals and carbon footprint, but you have to link. Um, and on the opposition side, I like how you started off your um, your response. I like your style, the way that you pause when you speak you, and you ask certain questions. Um, that was very effective. But I felt in taking the position that the organization should be more responsible, you really had to solidify why the organization should have been responsible. So just some things to keep in mind, but good job. I thought both teams presented very compelling arguments, right? Good use of data by both teams. Um, good use of empirical information are taught by both teams. For the proposing team, I thought the style was good, made it very, very personal. And, um, you know, spoke to personal accountability. I think that was the strength. Like to see a little more, a little more detail on how that personal accountability translates into organizations. I think you made a good point around that, but a little more depth into that would have helped the argument. On the um, on the opposing side, uh, you know, I like kind of where you ended up with the is is not a, is the, is the cost of choice, which I think was a very 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 powerful point. The cost of choice, and I just felt you could have spent a little more time on the cost of choice, you know, in terms of determining who is responsible or who should take accountability. But very 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 good points and good debate. Thank you, judges, and thank you to our debaters for your perspectives on such a timely topic. Congratulations to both teams. We now take a short break as our judges determine the results. Republic Bank is invested in our communities with over 80 million spent on projects and programs. We're empowering entrepreneurs with free tools and resources. We're the region's largest indigenous bank, spanning 185 years, 14 countries, and 23 subsidiaries. We were the first Caribbean signatory to the United Nations principles for responsible banking. We're giving our customers greater banking convenience with state-of-the-art electronic banking solutions. We're invested in you. You exercising to get fit and healthy, going to the rivers and beaches to spend time with the family, yet you're leaving the place dotty dotty. What if Chancellor Buko, the savannah, or one of the streets by we, let us reduce, reuse, and recycle and clean up the country? No matter your age or gender, everyone can be a good defender. Get into green with swim call. Get ready for the JTA Jackpot this Christmas at JTA Supermarkets. Unwrap the joy and get the chance to win over $300,000 in prizes with purchase. Picture this, a kitchen makeover, an unforgettable family vacation, and not one, but 10 shopping sprees valued at $5,000 each. But wait, there's more. 15 lucky winners can win a year's free groceries, a kid's toy shopping spree, or even a year's supply of free gas. Plus, we've got 35 JTA gift cards and a whopping 35,000 JTA thank you points up for grabs. It's the JTA jackpot where every gift is a merry surprise. The biggest Christmas sale is at CV Optical. Get an amazing 60% off designer frames. Also, get 40% off prescription lenses. Plus, you get a free pair of Polaroid sunglasses on selected purchases. See us today at CV Optical, affordable eye care for everyone. There goes my new car. Guess I'm back on my bike. Yo, bike? CG United offers new car replacement. Remember my monster truck days? Well, one night, I attempted a 50-foot pogo double backflip. I landed it and went to karaoke. It wasn't until afterward that my car got hit by that fisherman. He gave me some great mahi-mahi, though. Anyway, they paid fast and got me in a new car. Now, call it, cab. I want you to meet my alpaca guy. <laughs> new car replacement for the first year of ownership. CG United. Good like that. Attention all bakers, doubles, and roti vendors. Boost your income with Chiclisha high-quality, low-priced, all-purpose flour and new whole wheat flour. Conveniently packaged in 2kg, 10kg, and 25kg. Contact us for your wholesale and retail prices. Warrenville Canupia, 665-3336. Chiclisha Limited. Quality you can trust. 
This Christmas, get ready for the most enchanting holiday experience of the year. Journey into the heart of the season with Believe, Christmas Around the World, a mesmerizing Christmas concert spectacular. Immerse yourself in the spirit of Christmas like never before as melodies from every corner of the globe fill the air with joy and wonder. Experience the magic at two iconic venues. Catch the spellbinding performances at Napri Mabol on the 15th and 17th and feel the holiday chair light up Queen's Hall on the 22nd and 23rd. Tickets are available now at islandetickets.com or at Queen's Hall Box Office. Don't miss this unforgettable celebration of unity, love and the true meaning of Christmas. Believe in the magic of the season and let the world's harmonies inspire you. John Thomas's Believe. See online platforms for details. Welcome back. The results are now in. I invite the first and second debate teams to join us on stage. Congratulations to all six teams progressing to the quarterfinals. The three teams progressing are Presentation College, San Fernando, Holy Faith Convent, Cuba, Queen's Royal College, and incidentally, QRC is the only proposition team moving forward. Your confidence and your powerful remarks demonstrate the strength of the youth voice. We must strive to continue to empower our nation's children and young people, as it clearly demonstrated today that we are the future leaders of tomorrow. Thank you and congratulations to all. Now we move on to the draw. The draw determines the topic and the position for our three teams moving forward. Can a representative from Presentation College San Fernando please pick from the box? Can we please have a representative from Holy Faith Convent Cuba to pick from the box? And finally, can we please have a representative from Queens Royal College to pick from the box? Thank you very much. This draw determined the topic and the position for each of these three teams as they move forward. Thank you to all our debaters and our judges. Congratulations, everyone. The six schools that will be moving forward to our quarterfinals are Astra Boys, San Fernando Central Secondary School, Presentation College Chaguanas, Presentation College San Fernando, Holy Faith Convent, Cuba, Queen's Royal College. Thank you for making your point. We will see you next week at the quarterfinals. You're watching CNC3.